The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. For those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Pastor Eileen left her sermon with us in the eventuality that she did not make it back, so it is her meditation on the text that I bring to you this morning. One of my favorite movie scenes is from A Christmas Carol. It's the scene where Scrooge has returned to his home at the end of the business day. Frightened by his dead business partner, he takes a fire iron to his best dressing gown. As he goes from room to room, with only the illumination of a small candle, he imagines all manner of evil lurking in the corners, predators, robbers, murderers, perhaps. As I watch that scene, I remember the basement in the home my parents had when I was a small child. Mom kept canned goods down there, and she would send my brother and I down to retrieve a can of peas, a jar of jam, or some such thing for dinner. We hated those treks to the basement. Once you turned the corner from where the light was, The shadows were filled with all manner of monsters, or so we thought. Who knew what was lurking down there among the cobwebs? It was terrifying to a small child of six or seven or eight. I'm still not terribly fond of the darkness, not knowing what's beyond the corner where the lights are off. I don't relish wondering what sort of animal life is lurking outside our living room windows watching me read the paper. I'm not afraid so much anymore of things that go bump in the night, but I will admit that I much prefer the light of day, the sunshine, a well-lit room after the sun has set. Our texts for today are filled with references to light. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of darkness, on them light has shined. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Paul speaks of the darkness of division and the light of reconciliation. Finally, Matthew repeats the wording of Isaiah, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. We read scripture with a nod to the historical context. Roman occupation was a horrible thing. 
Christians had to communicate with secret symbols. Persecution was rampant. In the midst of that context, Matthew offers a glimpse of the opportunity to follow Jesus. Following Jesus must have felt like a blast of light from a thousand watt bulb. Here was hope. Here was salvation. Here was light. It would have been a beautiful thing in a world of oppression to follow the one who claimed to break the chains of oppression, to let the prisoner go free, to be the light for the world. The Corinthian community knew what it was like to live in the darkness. They were a community immersed in tension and fighting. Paul breaks the cardinal rule of preaching. He actually calls out the culprits by name, at least in this letter to the community. The believers were divided into groups based on whose preaching they liked the best. And the quarreling went on from there, I imagine. The cloud that hung over the community did not allow them to see the light of Christ very clearly. Paul reminded them that their light and their salvation is Jesus Christ alone. It doesn't matter who baptized them. It doesn't matter who confirmed them. It doesn't matter whose preaching they preferred. It only matters that everything leads to Christ and Christ alone as the hope of the world, the one who brings in the kingdom of God. We are not, thankfully, a community rife with tension and arguments. We do not live in a time or place where our faith must be practiced in secret. We do not live in a society where we are persecuted for following Jesus. But there are plenty of things that still scare me. This week, a refugee camp was bombed in Nigeria. Aid is blocked in Syria from reaching civilians who are starving. Last year, the temperatures of the earth continued to climb, reaching new heights and threatening the planet. This week, tensions roiled in Washington, D.C. during tense confirmation hearings and an inauguration of a president with record low approval ratings. New York remains one of two states who treat youthful offenders as adult criminals. Chicago, Baltimore, and other cities began to acknowledge problems with police brutality. Chemical dependence on heroin and other opioids increased in our suburbs. Perhaps the thing that scares me the most is that it appears we are on the brink of division. Two days ago, many of us celebrated the inauguration of our new president. Some of us are waiting to see what happens. Yesterday, some of us marched. Some to DC, some went to Seneca Falls. The rhetoric that pitted one group against the other was ugly and unconscionable. There is still much that is dark about the world we live in, and at times it threatens to consume us. Today, we gather around the cross, the word and the sacraments, to be reminded that the dark cannot consume us. Dark does not drive out light. Light drives out darkness. We gather in the light of Christ. We live in the light of Christ, who comes to reconcile all people to himself and to one another. We are a church about being the light of Christ. Just a month ago, we sat in this sanctuary, or one like it, with a candle in our hands, singing. For many, it's an emotional moment of quiet. The lights are extinguished, and the sanctuary is dark, and one by one, candles are lit. The light that originates with the Christ candle is passed from one believer to another, perhaps even to a non-believer in our midst. No one is excluded. 
the light of Christ becomes my light. My light becomes your light. Your light multiplies. It's never extinguished. It only multiplies as we pass it on. Jesus is here. His light cannot be extinguished, not by hatred or rivalry or warfare or even death. Jesus came to be light when our lives are the darkest. Jesus came to give us hope when our situations seem the most hopeless. Jesus calls us as surely as Jesus called Peter and Andrew, James and John. Jesus calls us to be a light for the nations. Jesus calls us, perhaps most poignantly today, to be a light for one another, to do what it takes to bring light to the lonely, the prisoner, the homeless, the poor. We are called to be the body of Christ in this place and the light for the world outside our doors so that all who see it may give glory to God, whose justice, mercy, and compassion shines through us.